Om. Welcome to another round of the book review. No, I'm not doing a Buddhist philosophy today, but I am talking about philosophy. And today I have Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. This is a book written by the one, the only Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of Rome. It was written in 161 to 180 AD, and it's unclear when it was actually published and whether it was published per se or someone took these notes from somewhere. Essentially, the book was written by him for himself, and that has both some good positives in it and negatives. Positives being that these are his true thoughts, unadulterated, no one else messing around with them. But he, it's not the easiest of reading, and the way it's set out is obviously just for himself, as well as with some internal notes that are really just particular to him. It's a tome of his thoughts and his reflections. Uh, towards the end of his life, he lived to around 59 years of age, so uh, with those later parts being while he was emperor of Rome. And you can see he's dealing with a lot of issues and mostly with his own internal thoughts and contradictions while going through this period and these are basically his notes of, of what happened and how he tried to improve himself it's split up into 12 chapters or books and they're not particularly ordered in any sense and in each chapter and book there will be a either a small or a long passage with going up to a, i think close to 40 or 50 of them and the books don't particularly have any order there's no structure or rhyme or reason to it but they, they're just like tiny little snippets of what he was going through, what he thought, and how he was dealing with it. Uh, apart from maybe the first book, which was a bit more of a, an ode or a thanks, a, an appreciation section to the people who had helped him and the mentors in his life. He was known as the Philosopher King, um, as described by Plato, that concept of a, a wise ruler who also was very thoughtful and, and kind and and tried to get to the bottom of things and was actually nicknamed during his own lifetime, the philosopher or the wise. So even when he was alive, people knew he was a, he was a pretty special dude. The themes of the book, he, it's essentially the stoic philosophy. And if you talk about stoic philosophy, this book will definitely come up and it's in general. So it, it doesn't set out the tenets of it, but it is talking about he was very influenced by it, and I get. I think you would call him a Stoic. Uh, but there is, I guess, nuances to himself where he wouldn't believe, say, some of the things that Epictetus said or, or some of the other Seneca, for example, as well. Uh, it was his own take, I guess, on, on the philosophy and what he believed in, in his life and, and how he tried to do it. But that being said, it's not a telling you book, like, this is Stoic philosophy, this is what you should do because he never meant to publish it. So this is why it's actually a really cool book because he's not, he's only speaking to himself. He's not speaking to others. There's one thing to, I suppose, clear up with that as well. The difference between stoic, stoic as a noun versus an adjective. So the stoic philosophy encompasses many things which you would not consider classically stoic in the sense of the adjective verb, which is a, you know, a hardened person who's immune to um, danger who suppresses their emotions who tries to get through things who's reliable who's dependable but stoic in the sense of the noun is it talks about what are some of the general tenets what are the moral obligations if you are a stoic what are some of the things that you think and which wouldn't even exactly fit into the stoic philosophy uh, stoic as an adjective but if you you know culminate a group of people who call themselves stoics you probably would say, oh, this is someone who suppresses their emotions. Oh, this is someone who's dependable. Oh, this is someone who doesn't get beat down by life easily. For, for So there's a little bit of a difference between those two things. Death is a very common recurrence in the book, and he talks about it quite a lot. It's not to be feared, and it is just another change. And I suppose what he talks about in the book is some of the techniques that you can use to I guess, put death in a more positive light or at least not fear it and make it debilitating. Some of these would be, I guess, stepping back from yourself and looking from the outside in, uh, using, I guess, the the thoughts of great men and even comparing yourself to, to great men. And he does this quite a lot. He'll say, where is Alexander the Great? Where are these other famous Greeks from history, which obviously had passed away. And yet people say, oh, 
you know, I wish I was like Alexander the Great. I, I want to accomplish all these things, but he, he will say, but why? They're, they're dead. Like there's no, there's nothing about them in particular that makes them immune from death, for example. So why should you? Even stuff like uh, disgust of the world, he, he'll, <laughs> he'll talk about many times where he personally is disgusted with people, with himself, with how the world operates and it's, I guess, the suffering in it, the cruelty, the unfairness. And so he'll even sometimes put a little spin on death and say, like, this is a good thing to go through. Like, you don't want to be stuck in this place where people are mean, people are selfish and self-interested. So he he talks a lot about death and why it is a, if not a good thing, it's not something to be feared. The present moment, and this crosses over a lot with Stoic philosophy and Buddhism, and you can see his own... I guess, process of alleviating the suffering in life. I don't believe they actually had connected yet in the sense of Buddhism going to the West. So this was his own, I guess, understanding of that same core principle, which was if you look in the present moment that you can't really feel suffering because suffering is always caused from desires either in the past or, or in the future. But if you're living right in the present moment, all you can do is observe and this is pretty critical throughout the book as well. And I think he uses this as a technique to get out of himself, out of his own suffering, take a step back and realize like, oh, okay, um, I'm using my emotions in this instance. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm worrying about this thing, which I know in five years time, I would have forgotten completely. Life's meaning, it also comes up in the book quite a lot. And it's a bit different from the meaning of life for him. He aspired to improve the common good. So everything he did was to make things better for the world and for people in general. And I think that's one of those ones that's, that's pretty hard to argue with in the sense of what, if you had to say what a good meaning of life is, that's pretty up the top there. And he doesn't force us on people. He doesn't say, this is what you should be doing with your life. He just says like, no matter what you do, you should consider how this affects other people. If you're a murderer, a rapist, yes, maybe the switchings in your brain, the wiring of it makes it so that you feel pleasure from murdering and raping people. But is this for the common good? Does that help other people? Obviously, no. So that's one of those things where he he has his own meaning of life and he uses that throughout the book. And I think you could say he lived a pretty good life. And obviously, we, we can't know from director, even like first person, accounts from that time because there's very little um, existing knowledge passed down directly in through the scribes and texts and whatnot. But from everything we do know, he seemed to be a good guy in, in essence. One of the other critical themes that comes out throughout the book is the dealing of emotions and having them is okay, but giving in to them for him is not okay. And I suppose for this is it's about the control aspect. Are you willing to let your emotions cr control you? And where in essence does your free will start? For him, I think he acknowledged rightly that we feel fear. We judge ourselves compared to others. It's a natural instant reaction. There's nothing we can do to stop that. But how quickly can you turn on your rational mind and say, oh, I don't need to follow this. I don't need to compare myself to Oh, I don't need to buy that car just because Jenny next door bought, bought it. Uh, I don't need to give in to the anger and hit that person because they're insulting me or my mother or whatever. He is very, mm, I suppose, like demanding of himself in that it's okay for these things to arise, but he's got to put a quick stop to them so that he can have that control back in his life. So those are some of the themes you'll see pop up throughout the book and as it is written in such a style where there's 12 chapters and 30 to 40, 50 little subtitles or chapters within them, you're going to see repetitions of certain themes throughout here and there. Some of them will pop up once or twice. Some of them pop up a lot more often. So these were some of the ones that I saw as, I guess, the major um, popping up and, and that I found of interest. Some of my own observations from the book, uh, many of his quotes are of common sense. And I suppose this is one of the things that really set him apart as, as a leader is that he had common sense. He wasn't grandiose in his own luxury and in, and 
everything that was being done to promote him. So some of these, just for example, would be luck can be created through hard work. Uh, don't associate with bad characters. They probably won't change. And if anything, they're just going to influence you. And don't waste your words on swine. So in essence, be a role model for people. If they're willing to acknowledge and know that they need to change and they ask you for help more, obviously help them out. But don't try and change people if they're not willing to change. You're wasting your time and energy. These are pretty common sense things. And it's really nice to see that pop up in the book as it shows that he obviously lived in the real world and was aware of the problems um, that needed to be solved and what he could try and do to, to solve them as a powerful person, as the emperor of Rome. He condemns the vacuity of fame, prestige, praise, power, and wealth. This as well sets him apart as a leader. He obviously was the most powerful person in the world during that era. The Roman emperor controlled, you know, this massive amount of land, massive amount of people. And he obviously as well would have received all the attention, received all the praise of people trying to curry favor, people trying to get things done, people trying to blah, blah, blah. He would be obviously inundated with all this sort of just useless pandering that for him, he was able to acknowledge like, this is not going to make me a better person by listening to these. Don't let that side of you, which enjoys being told that you're right, that enjoys being told you're infallible. Don't let that side of you ever, ever whisper in your ear and, and get to your head because you're going to, as soon as that happens, you start slipping and you make mistakes. The death of his kids definitely hardened him. And he is pretty merciless sometimes in this book with regards to feeling sorry for yourself. He died at the age of roughly 59, maybe 60. And by that time, eight of his 13 kids had already died with, I think, one or two of them dying very soon after his own death as well. Most of them would have been in early childhood. And, you know, that's, that's a really rough thing to go through for anyone. And for it to happen eight times in your life must have been, you know, very psychologically hard and a test for him. So throughout this book, you'll see many times, even he's very critical, even of people, if, you're, if your child is dying, if your child is sick, maintain that control, maintain that wisdom and keep pressing forward. This is no excuse. There's no excuse for, for feeling sorry for yourself and, and indulging in self-pity. Some of his personality traits as well were obvious in this book. And this is what makes him such a great leader. He wasn't infallible. He wasn't the perfect person and this book in essence is his own way of trying to fix himself and just by pure fortune it's been passed down throughout the ages and we get to look into the mind of someone who has managed to capture parts of their own personality and try and fix them so some of the things you obviously notice from him are anger disgust self-congratulation as well as intolerance of others especially if they lack virtues such as um, the virtues that he had and his own almost intolerance of giving out kindness he was very hard on himself and trying to forgive others and and still act with kindness towards them was very hard for him so there's many many times where he has notes for himself be more kind and do it from a genuine place don't do it from a a, a forced kindness but think of a way for yourself to be able to be kind to others and then actually mean it that on the other side he had some very very admirable qual admirable qualities which he obviously didn't need to work on these were his dutifulness he was curious respectful of nature and very smart obviously for dialogue rhetoric and philosophy and you could see in parts of this book where he's telling himself look you could have gone down the philosophy path you didn't you chose to be emperor so don't philosophize for for whatever reason, for just for willy nilly, because it's fun, do it because it'll help you become a better emperor and help out more people. The possibility of suicide was nothing uh, I actually knew about in Stoic philosophy. And he mentions that a couple of times. So he obviously thought about it a bit and it was something interest of interest to him. And I, I never actually knew that. I'd say for the, for the most part, there's me chucking in my own moral things. 
suicide is probably not something you want to encourage and it would only be in very special circumstances where people someone's in so much pain that you know dying would be better than living uh he probably talked about it a little bit too much for my liking in, in the sense that it was almost encouraging it but uh that being said it, it just brings up the whole point of is stoic philosophy the philosophy are there any bad points to it and there definitely are it's got some shaky grounds onto it there's a belief in like an eternal fire that will come and consume the world consume everything if the big crunch actually happens that could be true and they just knew about it you know two thousand years before uh, us mere mortals but they also believed in spirits and there was a bit of a naturalistic fallacy or the is ought problem as described by hume which was just because something is doesn't mean that it ought to be and just because you can find something in nature doesn't mean that that is a morally good thing so i feel like a couple of times he drifted towards that oh you can see this in nature therefore it's morally virtuous i i, I think nowadays most of us would disagree with that just because an animal is fighting tooth clay tooth claw and nail doesn't mean that that's what we should be doing just because we have anger and whatnot doesn't mean that just because it is doesn't mean it should ought to be he thinks in first principles as well so he tries to dig a little bit deeper and, and get to the bottom of things why is this the way it is uh, which i really enjoyed so in summary it's uh, a lot of wisdom packed into this book but you have to work for it as well it is written in ancient greek and while it's a little bit easier than i would say than 18th century english it, it still has parts where it's not flowing and the way the book is written in itself it's probably worth taking little snippets definitely recommended to read with the notes at the end which has a description of some of the places and times because those are uh, really help out so in all i'm giving it a seven out of ten and my pragmatic thing to take from this is take some of the better known quotes and add them to my own wisdom worksheet so that i can implement them more in my life that's it for today marcus aurelius meditations current out